You've had your Queen's speech. Now you're going to get the pistols at Christmas. Enjoy. Oh, where am I? Oh, Auntie, it's so nice to be back. I think I must have fallen asleep, and you'll never guess where I went in my dream. This is BBC One. A ray of hope flickers in the sky. A tiny star lights up way up high. All across the land dawns a brand new morn. This comes to pass when a child is born. A silent wish sails the seven seas. The winds of change whisper in the trees, and the walls of doubt crumble, tossed and torn. This comes to pass when a child is born. Once upon a time, many, many Christmases ago, in a small industrial town in Yorkshire, during another winter of discontent, a kind of miracle took place. The stars shone down on a frosty night, and the snow lay deep and even. So much strange happened that night, that's still worth celebrating, which sheds a lurid light on the great British Christmas, as we still know it today. Some it took place in Uddersfield. Something that might still tickle your fancy on the Yuletide sofa this many, many years later. Let's all now share a collective eruption and let the story commence. Very happy Christmas. It's nice to be all together once again. Beautiful. They're beautiful. Really beautiful. Welcome to Christmas Day festivities in Islanders in West Yorkshire. So it's going to be a goodie today. My word, oh yeah, it is going to be a goodie. Sex Pistols is the name of the game. They're the guys who are putting on this free party for you today. We've got some terrific prizes for you. We've got some albums, singles, skateboards to give away. Fantastic go. She's crazy like I hated that fucking song. That was a shit house song. Horrible. Daddy, Daddy cool. I love Daddy Cool. Yes, love Boney M. Daddy Cool, Daddy Cool. It's fucking horrible. Give us another one. And all the bells on earth shall ring on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. All the bells on earth shall ring on Christmas Day in the morning. A very, very Merry Christmas to you all. Welcome to the Christmas edition of Top of the Pops. We hope that you got the prezzies you wanted and the pudding isn't lying too heavy because uh, a bit of dancing to do to that. They always had the traditional Top of the Pops countdown on the Christmas Day and they'd all have their silly hats on and tinsel everywhere. And, you know, Dave Lee Travis with his big old beard and a bit of tinsel round his head. And it's like, oh. And I always hope you're enjoying the Boxing Day spirit like we are. That would be the highlight, actually, of the Christmas Day. Hello, and welcome to my little series on Christmas know-how. There you are, gentlemen. This is our wee country kids that warm our drama scrum here. So you can drink more and more and more. <laughs> Christmas, to me, is not just one room. If you walk into a forest, you've got trees everywhere. I'd like anybody who walks through that front door to see a tree. As they walk in, they see a tree. They go through that door, they see another tree. When they come in this room, they see four trees. 
I want Christmas everywhere in the ocean. No Christmas must be commercialized, in my opinion. We bring the rum pa bum rum pa bum rum pa bum We're supposed to be saving power at the moment, but somebody coming into this room might think that you're trying to use as much as possible. Well, shall I put it this way? I love Christmas, and I couldn't care less for any government at the present moment. Let's have a look and see what it is. It's very oh, nice, sir. Look at that. That's <laughs> my work. You're going to do well, isn't it? Over 100 patients at Dudley Road Hospital in Birmingham were led to safety tonight as troops fought a fire in the basement. It took them just over an hour to put out the blaze. Four hours general training and 20-year-old equipment isn't much use in tackling a fire with those dense chemical smoke. Two soldiers were overcome. A writing competition, now what you have to do is you have to write down what you would have most liked for Christmas that you didn't get. Did you have a nice rumbling Christmas? of Wimbledon. I wasn't that fun, huh? Blokes in furry kits with schnozzles. I would have thought that would have been a hell of a lot more scary than Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious, but, you know. <laughs> having traditional Christmases, I guess, at home with family. It's just like another Sunday lunch for us, really, Christmas, with a few presents for me. We start with the most important of all, the turkey, which is, after all, the British national bird. Now, this curious pinching movement that I'm doing here isn't just silly, but to loosen the skin so that afterwards I can put my hand underneath and begin the process of lubricating the dry bird because it doesn't do much for the bird's figure, let's face it. There's nothing massive like they are now. Everyone goes way over the top, you know, ridiculous. Starts in early November and it just goes on and on and on with all the songs, the adverts, the gifts, and it's awful, so over-commercialised and people just spend so much money and just seem to get themselves in debt. <laughs> Forty-five seconds starting from now. On the conveyor belt tonight, we have a food hamper. And everything you remember, you will take home with you tonight. Oxford Street is a thoroughfare of opportunity for the dedicated shoplifter, mingling with the crowds of Christmas shoppers. Most stores have had to take on extra security men to counter the shoplifting gangs. large toys are far too expensive and uh, with today's salary standstill one has to make do and in fact um, we make a good deal of the toys for the children I'm making him a fault at the moment my wife is making him a clown's outfit we were very poor nothing in our house was traditional in that way But then again, it, it really wasn't anywhere. I never seen the, like, the advertisements you'd see on TV of the family all gathered around the dead baked bird. So now I fill it into a nylon icing bag with no pipe affixed. And then all I've got to do is just squeeze until the bird's full. We had that, but not around a big table. It'd be everyone to their own chair and you eat off your lap. I think Christmas time is actually my worst time of the year. I still am not a fan of Christmas. Um, it's my least favourite holiday. Maybe it's to do with like when families get together and I had a shit family. I got some shit toy. My mum and dad went down the pub and left me by myself from a young age till I left home, basically, so not good. Steve used to come round to us for Christmas, so it was a bit tricky for him. Well, it's always that image of the grass is greener somewhere else, but I, I think a lot of people 
if they're honest with themselves are not fans of Christmas. I love the packaging of the toys more than the toys themselves. I can play with a cardboard box even to this day, and I love that. I love the unwrapping of the gift more than the gift itself. I can remember the train set. Oh, I loved it, Hornsby train set. I had one from before, you know, an old steam engine, but I knew those were old fashioned. I wanted a modern British rail kit, and I got it. This is the of the train. And it was fantastic. And I oh, was just watching that thing turn round and round and round. And then after, say, two hours, you're back to playing with the box. Because you could build things out of the box. You could build little houses and make little pretend stations for, for the train to stop at. Much more fun. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas just like the ones I used to know. Oh, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Well, the snow was always a problem because in the very early years, we used to live in a place called Benwell Mansions. There was two rooms with an outside toilet. When the snows were heavy, it meant you couldn't go and use the loo. And if you did, you know, certain parts of you could freeze up quite seriously. Tanks were set up in the street, but even they froze up and you needed hot water to thaw out the tap before you could get cold water to make hot water with. The church thing would be kind of all right at Christmas because I like the old organs blaring away. The hairs in the back of my head would, would stand up some of the tones and notes, which uh, actually led really beautifully into public image <laughs> years later. <laughs> you know, uh, trying to achieve those same horrific, yet at the same time joyous tones that would frighten you somewhat as a young kid, but you never forgot the awe and the power of that as a musical force. Were you ever in a nativity play, John? There was one I did, and I really liked the outfit. It was a royal blue satin pants down to the knee with grey socks and sandals, of course, working class style and uh, a really nice orange jacket that the nuns made. And, and, and I felt really good in that outfit. I wasn't the camel or the donkey. I don't know what part, I, maybe one of the three kings. But when I came off stage, the nuns were going, what happened to you? You were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, you know, could have ruined my acting career. Stephen, how old are you? Eight. Eight. Are you married? No. Have you got a girlfriend? No. Do you think, do you think girls are soppy? Yeah. Yeah, aren't they really? And how old are you, Sammy? Thirteen. Have you got a boyfriend? No. no. Right. I've got one lady who wants Dad back at work, which I think is a very good idea indeed. Don't we all, Ducky? <laughs> Our industrial correspondent says it's unlikely Mr. Callaghan will have anything new to offer the fireman, but he will be prepared to listen. The strike is still solid, there's no doubt about it. I the strike had been going on for nine long weeks, and many firemen had relied on handouts to get them through Christmas. 
Fireman's rates of pay are a long-standing grievance. £176 <laughs> pound a month. What's that nothing? The firemen began their strike expecting a rapid erosion of public support as fires got out of hand. But the men on picket duty claim they've been inundated with street corner donations and gifts of food. This fish shop owner, for instance, is offering the firemen four free meals a day. I was the first punk in the school. A friend of mine, his dad, was a fireman. When Christmas coming up, he was saying that things were really difficult for them. They weren't going to be getting the presents that they'd hoped for, that they normally got every year. It was really awkward for him. He didn't like to talk about it too much. <laughs> That time, up and down the country, the riots, strikes, striking miners, anybody who was striking really, which in them days was everybody. Those were serious times. Serious change in the way that the British culture was viewing itself. Twelve months, punk rock has become almost a battle cry in British society. For many people, it's a bigger threat to our way of life than Russian communism or hyperinflation. Before the Huddersfield show, we were still banned in many places around the UK. We'd come off the back of the Spots tour. Sex Pistols on tour, secretly. But I thought it was dreadful that we had to not be ourselves and go under secret monikers. Places like Cromer and little towns along the way in Newport, I think. So we was working our way up. There was an alleged tour that was going to happen, and I, I think all 27 gigs got cancelled. Every town we'd roll into, up would be the local MP or whatever. Now imagine that now where anyone would listen to a local MP. <laughs> so there's improvement on the domestic front. <laughs> Can you get me a rope? Get me a rope, OK? The bannings and the local council wars against us was pretty damn outrageous, really, and, and stupid. We have had punk rock in Birmingham, unfortunately, and now they're bringing out these freak punk rock groups. I've been, I know what I'm talking about. They do so much damage. The average adult can protest with his feet. The average adult will go see a strip show or a blue film. But after uh, their TV performance of the Sex Pistols, when foul language was used, the decision was made when we discovered it was mere children that would be watching the performance. Well, that Scotland was the most ridiculous banning of the lot, with the Lord Provost of Scotland declaring that they had enough hooligans in Scotland without importing them from south of the border. <laughs> I refuse to tell you what's under my kilt, but as a special New Year's treat, I'll tell you what's in my sporran, my underpants. I feel that this is the payoff of a punk society. I feel that we have punk parents, we have punk politicians, we have punk clergymen, and we have punk sportsmen. I feel the situation is punk, but I feel that it's not their fault. Well, we're going to have a look at some of the great, great sounds that we've been treated to uh, over the last year. And right now, here's a fabulous one from Rod Stewart. The first cut is the deepest. It was number one in the summer, May and June, for five consecutive weeks. What can I tell you about being banned by the BBC? Along with the Rupert Murdoch empire proclaiming that we were the moral fault. Yeah. You talk about Rupert Murdoch now, that was the beginnings of his nonsense. And that man and his approach to the truth was really damn difficult to skirt around. Why? Why do I have to lie? 
We knew ultimately, no matter what we did, it would be transferred into a lie and ridiculed and rubbished. Rupert Murdoch and his clones were making it worse and worse and worse, and they carried on, and nobody did nothing about them, just wanted to smear us. It's sad that we had to go through that and suffer the way we did for what is basically an honest message. Truth, you can't beat the truth, Vicar. Yeah. The truth shall make you free. Mm. 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 Poor Vicar, every time he comes in, he gets into trouble, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. We were just travelling, there was nothing to do. I mean, we were really kind of desperate, really, to just do gigs as the Sex Pistols. Barred from little chefs and happy eaters at each service station along the road, turned away from every holiday inn across the land, the four pistols wandered the motorways of the north in search of a gig. Then, lo and behold, a call came in from the striking fireman of Uddersfield. Where is this place? It is called Uddersfield. Do you realize what this means, gentlemen? What does it mean? It means that there is intelligent life on Earth. The firemen were on strike for a long time, and I think it was put in at the last minute to do a benefit for the firemen and their kids. It was just seemed like a great idea to play on Christmas Day in the afternoon for the kids, and then in the evening for the regular punters. Whose idea was this gig? Oh, it must have been mine. I had a vision in a dream that we should play Huddersfield for kids. Particularly the children of the striking firemen, as they were all just really broke and nobody giving a damn about them. So my friend Dean, so with his dad being out, he rang me up and told me he was going to it, and I was absolutely out beside myself with jealousy. Uh, a couple of days later, he rang me again and said, did I want to pretend to be his brother? Did I? I had to talk to my parents about it. They weren't very keen. It was Christmas Day, so I really had to plead and beg. And I worked on my mum, and in the end, that worked. So what would you have been doing otherwise on Christmas? Oh, I would have been buried in beaver somewhere. What would you have been doing, John? Sod all. You know, travelling up and down the M1, you know, looking for something to do. Two, four, six, eight. I remember it being just really grey and dark. There was no sun around at the time. Frost will be widespread tonight, and there'll be thick fog, particularly in northern England, all day tomorrow. Julian, as you well know, at the time, we didn't actually even have a bloody hotel on Christmas Day, did we? I remember getting to Huddersfield. It just seemed such a desolate place. When it's dark and grey, it just magnifies it even more. Grim. Very grim. Cradle of the Industrial Revolution, birthplace of rugby league, and famous from the Cadbury smash ads of the time. Uddersfield <laughs> Town in West Yorkshire was the first English football team to win the league three times in succession. <laughs> There might be a copyright infringement. Amongst its famous sons, Uddersfield can proudly lay claim to James Mason, Harold Wilson, and Patrick Stewart, OBE. A place like Huddersfield was pure hell. If you were working class, you just felt doomed and trapped and disenfranchised. And those are all the emotions that were running through me and my own culture from London, having to endure an absolutely arsehole government in an arsehole country, in an arsehole situation. It was grim down south, let alone grim up north. Just thought, oh, God, you know. But there was a lot of warmth there when we got there from everyone. The firemen were there waiting for us. Everyone was really pleased to see us, which, which made a change. It was like, oh, thank God, you know, someone wants us to play at last. 
spent a lot of time in the club in the daytime. Everyone was in such a great mood. Sid was there with Nancy, so he was happy. John was great around the kids, as he always is. I didn't really know rock stars, but I thought they might turn up and disappear. But it was just stunning. John came out with his hat on, his hat was passed around, his lovely sort of straw hat. Sid was outstanding. He came up to me and asked me a couple of questions. One of the things he wanted to handkerchief. There were these handkerchiefs that were being dished out, were part of the Free Anarchy handkerchiefs. because I've still got mine. I had a couple, and he said, can I have one of these handkerchiefs? You know where I can get one, because they won't give me one. <laughs> so I gave him a handkerchief. They were all talking to people and really getting involved in the whole thing. You could tell they really loved being around the kids. There was a lot of food laid out for all the kids. There was a lot of stuff there, and flags and pistols, memorabilia and T-shirts. Presents, because obviously they were struggling to find them and their kids at the time. No Christmas, nothing, so we put all that on. Flooded the place with cake. Oh, the cake. <laughs> the cake was something I'll never forget. It was massive. John came out and cut it and was dishing out plates to people. After he'd sort of dished out and the kids were wandering around, I was standing there with a fork, just eating bits off the side of the cake. And I turned around and there was a chap with a camera filming straight at me. It was you. <laughs> Who was it that wanted a skateboard for Christmas? Ah, hang on, did anyone get a skateboard this Christmas? We will give you an album as well to go with the skateboard, because it's all given away today. I was just buzzing. I had all this stuff, everything from badges to a skateboard. How I got a skateboard at Sex Pistols gig, I will never know, but I came back with a skateboard. What would you like? The skateboard, oh, that's the most popular thing of all with the children. If you deny any child the right to believe in Santa Claus, then you're one nasty, evil, spiteful, twisted adult. The ultimate Christmas song is Slade. Every year it's the same old songs, and so you've got to listen to them all again every year, you know. I'm, I'm glad we didn't do one. I don't even know how it fucking goes. It's fucking horrible. I've been asked from the day I joined the Pistols onwards to write a Christmas song. And every year somebody comes up with like, oh, I've got a good idea, well, don't you? Never. <laughs> We started to get fired up and we were down the front, dancing around. There was a big build-up. You could sense it was getting towards the time the band were going to play. Here we were, the alleged most toughest band in the world at that point, and we'd have to play to seven-year-olds. <laughs> There's an awful lot you have to leave at the door. OK, gang, this party is given to you absolutely free and at the expense of the Sex Pistols, so let's have a big cheer for the Sex Pistols. Come on, let's hear it. Because they are giving you a Christmas party. Yeah, there's more people you here and there. Doing a couple of
so weird playing to all these young kids with their, their scarves and flags waving about. It was such a great feeling. When we started the gig, I thought it was a bit risky. How on earth am I going to be jumping up and down and screaming anarchy here with any sense of realism? Well, kids totally knock you into place with that. And you could see it on their faces. They just thought this was the best fun they'd ever had. And there you go, there's our audience going, well done, John, you're one of us, a big, stupid kid. I mean, there, there were no parents going, oh, I can't have my children seeing this beastly thing. There was none of that at all. It was like, thank God somebody cares about us. All through the whole day, you could hear the parents saying, what a wonderful idea it is, and, you know, well, we've never really liked this punk rock thing, but what these people are doing for us is fantastic, and how it changed their view. What they read about, what they heard about, was these dreadful people who were going to wreck the country and destroy our children, but they were really impressed. If you're playing in front of kids, you're not going to be out of order. You're not going to start kicking them in the head, are you, and gobbing at them? Some geezer on stage with a big green thing on his head. That's John. Oh. Sid found this such a challenge. He really had to have a serious talking to beforehand. Yeah. He wanted to be the hardcore, tough rocker bloke, and it's kind of like that. No, that ain't the right way to get the message across, Sydney. That's the problem with music in the past: people posturing. Okay, ready to rock. A child will know when you're faking it, so you can't go on and be your worst Johnny Rotten. You're actually going to have to be your best Johnny Rotten. John was passing the mic around to all the kids, and all the kids are shouting their names out, which was lovely. It is quite great how kids pick up the words very, very quickly and then get to sing the song with me. I think young kids got the pistols more than the grown-ups, really. I saw a comedy aspect in it, or a vaudeville, you know, a theatre show. It just looked like pads of mine. It was. It was carry-on sex pistols. It was Steve as Sid James. <laughs> oh, there you are. Job. I Job don't know. Yeah, something really awkward, right? <laughs> well, I thought you'd like to know. There's another strike on. Who is it this time? The eunuchs. Those films when I was very young, they, they were very important to me. They were hilarious. And, and, and everybody grew up with that, that sense of wit and humour. <laughs> we had all bases covered as far as the pantomime thing was concerned. We had Sid the villain, John the Dickensian character out front and Steve with the comedy and me sitting at the back holding it all together, the straight man if you like. And Malcolm was usually the Scrooge character in the pantomime but even he changed for Christmas Day. For me the Sex Pistols was absolutely about the humour. I open up in pantomime at East Ham tomorrow, and that's a song I should be ruining twice daily. So I hope you'll come along and see me. Terry Dugan is getting dressed for the job. He's one of the most experienced pantomime cats in the business. 
This year, Terry should claw up his 2,000th appearance as Cat, with the latest in a long and distinguished line of Dick Whittington's. Meow. Hello, puss. Where did you spring from? Well, I think the secret is knowing that you are playing a cat and doing things that a cat would do. When you're playing with a man, you can be more boisterous, like I can jump up onto him, whereas with a girl, you can't. You've got to be careful where you put your paws. So off he goes to the Wimbledon Theatre. What's new, pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. What's new, pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. Pussycat, pussycat, I've got flowers and lots of hours to stay. I was always pantomime on every Christmas, and all the shows on TV was all sort of pantomime based and comedy, Eric and Ernie, and all that stuff, traditional British Christmas. Tradition, tradition, the pantomime tradition. To be believed, it really must be seen. We're not to see the wizard. Hello, Mother. Clear off. I wonder if you lot could give us a contribution to the IMF. The IMF? Christmas TV, let it babble on infinitely. Sometimes it can be fun. <laughs> Listen, Christmas is fine. It's always been boring, you know that. If you rely on the TV for entertainment, you are a fool to yourself and everybody else. Great time as well, you know, along with the kids. And John smashed his head right into the cake, and all the kids were just throwing cake out. I had a cake started flying, and then it just went insane, mental brilliance, absolute slapstick. Just added to the flavour of a pretty near terrifying Sex Pistols song. Showed the lighter side of it. John's got pie all over him. He's like happier than a pig in shit. Kids can be such um, a bounce back to reality. Don't forget the fun. Because it, it all got a little bit too serious. Astonishing. I can never forget they played Bodies, which was quite a surprise. <laughs> Me, as knowing the song, was a, a little bit shocked that they were playing that in front of a load of kids, but fine, I loved it. saying fucking, that's good. What do you mean? Oh, you don't want to fuck this, fuck that bit. I don't think he was doing that bit for the kids. That was good, right? Wonderful, brilliant vibe, atmosphere, loved it. And it knocked the stuffing out of Sid, I've got to say, too, for his like, trying to be tough, you know. How can you be tough with a Christmas cake in your face? <laughs> That's when he realised that he's a kid after all. What better present? I wish I was a kid in the audience watching that. It was 
the best cake fight I've ever been in. Utterly brilliant. I've still yet to find out who I sent my dry cleaning bill to. <laughs> It was one of the things in my life I will never, ever forget. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was the talk of the school. I was the only one there from the school that had done it. Not long after that, did the classic thing, formed a band, and I worked in sales, I joined the police, I did that for a long time, but I'm always happy to talk about seeing the pistols. Bring out the bottle, bring on the cheer. Mr. Bartender, I'll have another beer. Tomorrow I'll be hurting when that awful pain begins. The wheels fell off the wagon and I'm getting wild again. I remember like watching the airlocks get completely paralytic, which was fun for me because that meant I could put the records on the old dancer. No one else is capable of putting the records on. I'll take over. And I'm in my own universe. I'm looking at the labels. Oh, it's the Kinks. Ha ha. You really got me. The concert tonight from the Kinks, ladies and gentlemen. And I've had such a love of music ever since. Christmas men, yippee, they'd give us a baby sham and maybe a warnings advocar mixed with lemonade called a snowball. Girly drinks, but when you're five years old, ooh, that knocks your socks, you know? And then later, when the party's over and you can creep back in and talk to your mum and dad when all their friends are left, uh, you can have a little tipple of Guinness. Aha, that's Christmas. I wouldn't be drinking today if it wasn't for my parents. <laughs> Kids need to be introduced slowly, subtly, but definitely into the adult world. Don't deny that these things go on and don't say that's not for you. Because when you do that to a young kid, that young kid is going to make damn well sure it's for him, her or them. As darkness fell that Christmas day, young punks and Luddites from Wakefield, Bradford and Leeds began the long march across the moors of West Yorkshire. Get off my land! That's where you go. And you, you'll get on that road there. Over my dead body. There's a road there. Go on, get up that road. Down through the dark satanic mills of Horbury and Halifax to the sanctuary of Ivanhoe's in Huddersfield itself. Just another normal, boring, <laughs> nothing day, like every other Christmas day. And the Queen's speech came on, and we just said, oh, no, not this again. Her message was no longer relevant. <laughs> it was the Sex Pistols' message that was more important. <laughs> so we just set off walking to Huddersfield to see Sex Pistols. I remember it being 16 miles, but it's only nine miles now, but it took us three hours. No trains. Couldn't afford a taxi. Couldn't afford a taxi. Uh, nobody had any cars at that hour. We were too young. He was only 15. I was just turned 17. So walking was the only option. We broke so many laws that day because it was illegal to play on Christmas. It was illegal to buy a beer. Can you imagine that? As we got to the gig, there was about five or six punks, maybe 10, and uh, them that told us the gig had sold out. So we just sat down on the floor because we were tired from walking and then somebody brought some sandwiches out that were left over from the party in the afternoon. Malcolm got us in the gig, yeah, he said the pistols wouldn't play unless you let these, these half a dozen punks in the gig.
John is still in a good mood. Sid's focused. I think I'm Johnny Funders. It's good footage, this. <laughs> As the Pistols, we first went up north, it was unbelievable, the hatred for like, oh, you southern softies, you, you cockney bastards, and, and it'd be just the four of us dealing with, you know, up to 300, like, you know, full-on firms turning up at gigs wanting to smash our heads in. But, you know, we piled through there. <laughs> Good things came out of the Pistons for me. I was going to football, and the only time I ever met anybody from another city, there was just a big punch up, you know. And uh, I'd rather get on with people. And, and what I loved about the old punk scene was uh, it didn't matter where you come from. Punks started to merge together from different parts of the country, and they became us, not us and them anymore, just us. Places like Huddersfield is an absolute proof of that. I hitched hiked all over the country watching loads of other bands and whatever city I landed in, um, as, soon as, you, as soon as you met punks, they'd put you up for the weekend. It felt like there was something special. The people were coming together with some kind of union going on, things were changing. But we all realised we're all going through the same nonsense here. Why are we fighting each other? We found out who the real enemy is. Turned our weapons on those that need to be turned onto. The Pistols broke a lot of taboos. Gender is another one that they burned down, and racial issues. It was about being inclusive, not exclusive. It didn't matter what your sexual orientation was, what nationality you are, where you lived or anything. You know, and they were the first band that made that happen. All we had in mind was to view each other as equals. Creativity and equalness for everyone and anything. Bring Babylon down. One, two, three, Afterwards, and he seemed really relaxed and friendly, and that. And we spoke to him for about half an hour. I think he came up to Chris and he tried to tap a fag off you, didn't he? <laughs> for him to just walk up and start talking to us and, and talking to you like he was just your best mate, there was no I'm in a band, your little pleb who's come to see us. It, there was like a respect, a common bond type thing. He said to us, if we play any gigs in London, come along and we'll try and get you in on that. That stuck a uh, massive chord with me personally. I know I don't 
remember a lot, but I was totally aware we were doing a show for firemen who'd been on strike and they were skimped. And I was happy I was doing it. And it got me out of my own head for a few hours. Saying that, I was still miserable. To be honest with you, I was kind of depressed most of the time and just used to drown it with booze. I was just trying to escape. I don't know where I was trying to escape to, but I really didn't like being in my own skin. It doesn't matter what band you're in or what you've got going on the outside. If you're a lonely soul inside, and you try to cover it with booze and sex and drugs, that's not a solution. I was having a good time. People think you're having the best time of your life. You're in a big band and it's all going on, but I'm sure when I used to watch Top of the Pops and watch Sweet performing a song, I bet one of them was miserable too. You're not like that now, though. No, I'm not. I'm happy as a clam right now. That's why I whistle so good. I get glimpses of what it was like back then and, and how unhappy I was as a 21, 22-year-old guy who had no tools on how to live. No education from my parents or at school. Huddersfield was the very last gig the Sex Pistols played in England, and they went off to America and murdered each other. band that's the closest we've probably ever been you'd never think we were going to split up you know a month later in the at the end of the u.s tour if you saw us that day in Huddersfield. Or... i didn't think it was going to be over in three weeks The tensions was there in us, was it? because, I mean, we couldn't get the gigs, and then Malcolm was a false prophet, it was all mouth and no trousers. Never gave us anything to get to grips with as a group, so we could never really be solid with each other. And because of that, we began to hate each other, because there was nothing else to do but hate each other. I think we were resigned to it not lasting much longer, which is why everyone was very chilled out about it all and they knew we were going to split up in a funny sort of way, I think, and kind of knew this might be our last show. Save, save us going off and coming back on, we'll do another one, right? But after this one, it's all over. <laughs>
actually, I think the Sex Pistols finished in Huddersfield. But America was like a delusion. Lost the vibe. Couldn't get that vibe back. It's kind of like we've had enough of this and it's all over and then what a great way to go out, you know. Day to people at Huddersfield being a real lot to me. In a quiet moment when it had all ended late, a little tear in my eye. And in all of the Sex Pistols, I've got to say, that gig left me feeling like I'd actually achieved something. I don't think there'd be a Christmas as good as that one, unless the Sex Pistols are going to play this Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually probably the, the best Christmas I had because I was actually doing something. For me, I'm glad that, like, this is now being shown. It's been an awful long time. It's been buried, in, you know, in, in sealed vaults. But it's kind of appropriate now. You, you gather what it really was we were truly about way back then. You know, it was always from the heart. And Huddersfield shows that, I think, really well. Happy Christmas, everyone. So I just got to say, yo, ho, ho, everyone, and have a great time. Oh, just think of Huddersfield. That's Christmas enough. <laughs>